Hello everyone, today we will be talking about attention and the important associated with attention in terms of visual and auditory recognition. So our discussion last week was over the topic of pattern recognition and identifying objects and making sure that we knew what those objects were. Uh, let that be a visual object or let that be an auditory stimulus that we may potentially encounter out in our real world. And last week during our lecture, I mentioned the importance of attention. And I said it's very important for you to be able to have attention to be able to perceive the object. Because remember, there's this distinction between perception and also recognition. With perception, remember that we're talking about can I identify that something exists out there in my world? Versus recognition, which is I know what this object is and I give it a category name or I apply a label to it. But I mentioned that if we don't pay attention to an object that exists out there in the world, we're never going to be able to perceive it. That's where we always come up with this idea of, well, if a tree falls in the wood, does it make a sound? And the answer is technically yes, because of course it's going to make a sound because we would assume that it's going to have physical properties associated with the action. But for me, I'm not going to process that information because I'm unable to perceive it. So if I'm not around and I'm not paying attention to that object, I'm never going to be able to perceive it. It doesn't matter if I know or do not know what that object is that or what the what the event was, but what matters is that if I'm, if I'm paying attention and I'm close enough in proximity to have that sound stimulus or that visual stimulus be present. So if I'm not paying attention and if I'm not looking in the direction of that stimulus or if I'm not close enough to be able to hear the sound, I'm never going to be able to pay attention and be able to perceive that object and thus process it for later recognition. So when we think about attention, I guess one of the big questions that we always encounter is what is actually attention? Attention, the way it is defined, is really describes a set of processes that allow us to concentrate on one set of events in our environment while ignoring other events. So in other words, attention is the mechanism that we use to be able to focus in on one given event or one given stimulus and ignore other things in my environment. So when you're driving, for instance, think of attention as being the following. That when you're driving, you're focusing in on the road. So even though there are other things that exist around your world, so there are other cars, the wind is blowing outside, it may be raining, the sun is shining, there are clouds out there, there's music that's going on in your car, your phone may be vibrating or whatever the case may be, there's all these other things, but yet your attention is focused solely on the road and on the action of driving, not on other things that are occurring in your world. So just because you're not paying attention to those other things in your world, does that mean then that they cease to exist? And the answer is no. They do not cease to exist, but rather we are just focusing on one particular item or one particular event in my world that is really focusing my attention. Now with that being sa said, are there or do we have the ability to be able to process other things from my world but yet I'm not necessarily aware of them? And the answer is also yes. So in other words, we are able to process information that exists out there in our world, but yet we don't necessarily know that we're paying attention to it. So when we think about attention, don't think of attention as being 100% focused on one given object because that's not the way it exists. But rather, attention dictates for us a certain percentage of attentional you know, processing skills to a given event or to a given stimulus, but yet we still have to have attention on other things in my environment. Why do I have to pay to other, attention to other things in my environment other than just the stimulus that's in front of me? Because there are other things in my world that may potentially be hazardous or be dangerous to us that may potentially affect us in a negative way. So here, even though I may not necessarily be consciously aware that I am processing other things around my world, I'm still taking some of that information in even though I'm only conversing with this one person here or I'm looking at this particular object on the screen. I'm still processing some information at a lesser degree, but I'm still trying to process it. So attention really works in terms of controlling our mental environment and by choosing what I really want to focus in on. So when we think about attention, think of attention as being focus. So here we always say focus of attention because that's what we're doing. We're focusing in on a particular item, on a particular event, on a particular sound, smell, taste, uh, temperature, or touch, or whatever the case may be, whatever sensation it is that you want to process we are focusing in on that particular item. That's ideal for us. We would love to have 100% processing occur, but yet that's not going to happen because again, we still need to have processing of other things in my world just in case they may be important as well. 
So we always use terms like paying attention. Uh, we always say pay attention or pay attention to what I'm talking about because ultimately what you want is you want the person to focus in on one particular aspect of what's going on. Ignore other things in your world and focus in only on this. But yet that's an impossible task because even though they may focus in on what you're saying, they're still processing other things around you. So if you've ever been in a situation, for instance, when you're on the phone and you are talking on your phone, but yet there's somebody else talking also around you, it's very, very difficult to focus in on both conversations. So even though the other person that's in your in your world right there, right, that's actually in person, not on the phone, is not talking talking to you, they may be talking to somebody else, it's very difficult for you to concentrate on the conversation that you're having on the phone because they're both competing for the same resource of auditory attention. So here, what do we have to do? We have to eliminate one of those options, either we hang up the phone or we move away from the person who's talking as well that's in person so that, that way we can then really focus in our attention to that one particular conversation. So when we think about attention, attention really functions like a filter. And why is it, does attention function like a filter? Well, imagine our world as being the following. So out here in our world, we have all these events, right? So all of these are going to be considered to be events. And what we have is we have attention functioning. So here is the ultimate goal that we want to reach, right? So this is the point where I'm processing information. So what do we have here in terms of all this information? Think of attention as being this filter, OK? So this filter here, this funnel that we have, initially allows all this information to come in, right? So we have this filter, this funnel that's coming in, and it's bringing all this information in. So think of it like being your eyes, right? So in your eye, when we look at the world, we're not just focusing in on one single thing out there in the world. So for instance, we're not just focusing in on this one particular dot, but rather our eyes are looking at that one dot and they're also looking at some of these other objects here. So unless this one little dot takes up your entire visual field, your vision is trying to process some of this information out here. So even though I'm focusing my attention right here, I'm still having some attentional processes around here because it's important for me to see what else is out there even though I'm only looking here. So my peripheral vision allows me to process some of this information. So here if we imagine this as being our visual field and we're looking in our we're looking with our eyes, we see all these objects out here. But in reality, I just want to focus in on one single thing. So I want to focus in only on that. But yet all of this information is coming in. I need to have a mechanism that allows me to filter and funnel some of this information in. So once it is that we get down here, all I have is the good stuff that I'm really looking at or the good stuff that I'm processing. So here we allow a lot of information to come in, but then towards the bottom, we allow only very, very, very specific information to get in. And in reality, that's the way attention works. That first we have all this information that's coming in, but then we start minimizing what it is that we're processing by focusing in more on the item or on that stimulus. So thus, once it is that we get to the end of the bottle or the end of that funnel, we are only processing one piece of information. We also seem to call, or, or we also tend to call this idea of attention the bottleneck effect. And with the bottleneck effect, it functions the exact same way as the funnel. That at the bottom of the bottle, you have a lot of information that's being held or you have a lot of information that can come in. At the top of the bottle, it's very narrow and only some of the information comes in. So there's limits to what's able to come in through that bottle. So here, even with the bottleneck effect, we have this ability to be able to funnel out or focus in on specific information that's really coming in. So when we think about attention, is attention important? Absolutely. But when we think about attention, attention has limits. So when we think about the properties associated with attention, attention is not limitless. We actually have limited amounts of, of attention that we can process. And a lot of the aspects associated with attention in terms of its limit is this aspect of fatigue. That's a huge issue here that we encounter because what we find is that the more tired that we become or the more fatigue that we become in a situation, the more limited our attention is going to be. So in other words, I'm not going to be able to process and hold information in or focus in on information for very long because I'm tired and I'm focusing on other actions. So here, we also feel that attention is limited because again, if we think about that funnel effect, here we have lots of information that's coming in, but yet down here, only some information is actually coming in. So here, we don't really have too much information that's being available for us in terms of this funnel. So it doesn't really allow it. 
Attention is very selective as well. So in other words, there are lots of things out there in my environment. So again, remember, there's lots of things that are out here that I'm processing, but in reality, I only want to focus on one little particular thing. So here, I really want to be selective in terms of what I'm processing, and I want to try to ignore as much as I possibly can. What we also find is that attention is a part of everyone's cognitive architecture. So in other words, everyone has the ability to attenuate to specific information. Now granted, some individuals have better attention spans, if you want to think about it in terms of that, than other individuals, but yet we all have the ability to pay attention. We all just have varying degrees of attentiveness, if you want to think about it in that capacity. So again, these are the core properties associated with attention, that it's limited, it's selective, and everyone has the attentional ability. So when we first look at limiting attention, one of the first things that we find is that our attention system is, limit, is limited, that I don't want to process everything out there in my world. I have no necessity for processing every single thing that exists out there. Why do I not want to focus in on everything out there? Well, because not everything is important. So right now, for instance, that I'm recording this lecture, you may not be able to hear it, but I hear it very clearly. There's somebody mowing a lawn right outside the window where I'm recording this lecture. So now that I'm thinking about the person who's mowing that lawn and I'm still talking to you guys about attention, I'm now also giving some attentional resources to this person who's mowing the lawn. And that sound keeps getting louder and louder and louder for me. And even though it's really not getting louder in terms of its amplitude, and it's not getting any closer, it's getting louder for me because my attention is pulling me in that direction and it's telling me, hey, you know, I'm going to be pulling some of that information in and I'm going to be processing that information because for you it seems to be important. So I continue to process some of that information because it's readily available even though it's not important. But now as I continue to tell myself that's not important, that's not important, that's not important, it starts minimizing its, abil uh, its availability to me. So even though it's there, it doesn't seem as loud to me anymore because now I'm telling myself, don't focus in on that particular item or that event that is exi existing out there in the world. Rather, focus in on what you're currently doing, which is giving this potential lecture. So here, I don't really need to focus in on all these things because that doesn't really affect me. All these other things out there in my world don't affect me. What does affect me? What I'm paying attention to. So we see that even in terms of the things that we're encountering in our uh, daily lives, our activities, we tend to have limited, uh, limited amounts of time that we can focus in our attention. Because again, the aspect of fatigue really does come into play and potentially may hurt us. So as more time comes in, as we continue to focus in on a particular task, we find that the more time that we spend engaged in that task, we find that performance in terms of attention begins to decrease. So even right now, for instance, that I've been talking for about, what, six or seven minutes in terms of the lecture, actually 12 minutes, I'm not a very good uh, a, a count in terms of time here apparently, but in terms of being able to talk for 12 minutes, for you who's paying attention to me or paying attention to this lecture, you may have already paused a couple of times because you may have already lost track of what it is that I'm talking about, and that's okay because in reality, that's part of what attention should do. Attention should tell me, I'm no longer focusing in on the activity here, my performance is beginning to decrease. So my attentional ability is beginning to decrease, so I'm gonna end up having more errors occur in my recollection of this information. Why will that happen? Again, because of fatigue. Fatigue is going to come in and fatigue is going to tell me, hey, you know what, I'm getting tired of this particular task. Maybe you should try changing tasks and become more uh, um, engaged in that particular task and that might be more interesting to you. So here, as I get more tired, I start having more errors. I start having more errors because you're getting tired in this particular case. Now we see that fatigue plays a very, very crucial and important role in our ability to process information. And we've actually done lots of research, lots of experiments on this idea of how fatigue may potentially hinder performance. One of the things that we find is that we find that attention continues to diminish across time when we ask individuals to keep focused on this particular dot. Now one of the things that we want people to do while they're looking at this dot is we want them to tell us if there's any skips that occur in terms of the dot. So one of the things that we find is that the dot will continue to move in a clockwise fashion here. And as the dot continues to move, and as you're more engaged in this task, as time continues to pass by, it becomes harder for an individual to actually become vigilant and announce when the dot is actually skipped. 
And why does that happen? Because your attention begins to deteriorate and it begins to move to other options. So it begins to focus in on other things, maybe the shapes of the circle, maybe on the colors of the circle. So here you start moving to other things other than becoming vigilant of the dot itself because you're becoming tired. This is a very, very normal thing that happens to us. Even think about studying, for instance, at night. When you study at night, it becomes harder as it gets later into the night because you start getting more tired. Your body then starts focusing in on this ability for you to be, be tired and it starts saying, hey, you're tired, you should really go to sleep. Because once you go to sleep and you allow your batteries to get recharged, in the morning you can then wake up and focus your attention more diligently on the task. But here, we always assume that I'm gonna pull an all-nighter and I'm gonna do great on the exam. And then people get concerned as to why they didn't perform so well on the exam when they pulled the all-nighter because they're so tired that they're not able to focus in on the task itself. So here we find uh, in terms of uh, the individual's ability to be able to detect those skips, in, and this is just our representation of our results of that previous example here of the clock, we find that as time continues to pass by, we start finding more and more errors occurring in our, in our situation. So we start finding more and more errors occurring as times continue to pass by. But you'll also notice now that we have this plateau effect here. This plateau effect here is a very, very important finding that we find, that even though we begin to be more and more tired as time continues to pass by, errors seem to be plateauing. So our ability to accurately respond to this task seems to plateau. Why does this happen? This potentially happens because our ability to pay attention to the task becomes limited at that point. So it's reached its maximum availability and from then on out it's never going to be better but it can potentially not be worse unless something else happens in my environment that completely distracts me from that situation and may potentially lead me to have another error. But here since we assume that nothing else is distracting us and this is completely based on fatigue, there's going to be a point where you're just going to respond exactly the same because no matter what happens even though you're already very tired the task in itself is just not gonna lead you to any more potential errors in that instance. So as we can see that attention is very limited in terms of some of the aspects associated with the way that we process information, we also can identify that attention is also selective in its nature. Now, one of the incredible findings that we find associated with this idea of attention is that attention in itself is not necessarily always constant. And whenever it is that we have multiple stimuli that we have to try to attenuate to, it becomes very, very difficult for us to be able to achieve adequate processing of both types of stimuli. So in certain situations when we're out there in the real world, we find ourselves trying to attenuate or trying to pay attention to one specific stimulus over another. So in these specific situations, even though both stimuli exist out in the physical world, we have to cognitively process that information and consciously tell ourselves, I am only going to focus in on this piece of the conversation and I'm going to ignore what other individuals are saying. Now, that is a very difficult thing to do for us to try to eliminate and try to you know, select what information it is that's appropriate and what information it is that's inappropriate for us to be paying attention to. Now here when I say inappropriate, I don't mean it has to be dirty in any capacity, but rather it's just inappropriate that I don't really need it and it's not gonna function for me in any capacity. But for instance, if you've ever been at like a party for instance, and you are taught having a conversation with someone and there's people next to you also having a conversation, their conversation may also seem like an important conversation that you may wanna be paying attention to, but at the same time, the conversation that you're having with an individual is also relevant and also important. So in that specific situation, what do we do then? Well, we may try to pay attention as much as we can to the person that we are talking to, even giving them subtle hints like, yeah, of course, I completely understand what you're talking about. And yes, very interesting, and mm-hmm. But in reality, you're probably focusing your attention on the conversation that's happening next to you. Or even in a situation such as that where you're trying to focus in on the person that you're talking to, if other people next to you are also having a conversation, it becomes very, very difficult for us to be able to keep uh, our attention on the conversation that we're having. It even becomes very difficult for us to be able to select the right words for us to even communicate with that individual. 
So we find that in terms of aside from attention being limited in terms of how much it is that we can actually retain in terms of our processing ability and also that fatigue plays a huge role in how much uh, processing we're going to be doing to uh, stimuli out there in the real world, we also have to focus in on this idea that attention is also going to be selective in its nature. So we're going to be focusing our attention on specific elements that exist out there and not necessarily having to process everything that exists out in my world. So even right now, like I was mentioning before, that I was recording the lecture and somebody was cutting the grass outside, I could hear the lawn more, but then as I start trying to focus my attention more on the task of me trying to lecture, it becomes much more dim of a sound, even though the amplitude remains the same. So the physical stimulus remains the same, but as I'm focusing more attention, it starts funneling that information out. So it almost starts filtering it out for me. And that's part of what we do in our daily lives, that we encounter so many different stimuli, but yet in reality, we may only focus in on some parts of the information that's being processed in those specific situations. Uh, Cherry, back in the 1950s, did a very incredible study that kind of looked at the first ideas associated with attention being selective. Because for the most part, people just assumed that if uh, multiple stimuli were being presented to you, you were going to try to process as much information as you possibly could from both stimuli. Resources were going to be competing in this, in this specific instance. Attentional resources were going to be competing for the processing of specific types of stimuli. But yet what Cherry was talking about in this specific instance is that we almost tend to drown out the noise from one of the other stimuli. Uh, so in, in essence, what we try to do is we try to ignore that other stimulus and we really try to focus our attention on one. So even though it's there, you can really still kind of focus your attention on the one that you really want as your primary, but yet the other one still creates some types of interruptions. So Cherry back in the 1950s did a, a very... Uh, a very important uh, research study for us in which he used what was called the shadowing task. And the shadowing task essentially uh, looked at this idea of, well, if we're having a conversation and we're having stimuli coming in from one auditory um, from one auditory side, so for instance, on your right side, and then we still have auditory stimuli coming in from your left side, are you able to process information from both or are you able to filter out and not pay attention and ignore stimuli that's coming in from the second one? So what we find that it, at the initial point, it's quite a difficult task and it takes quite a bit of time to be able to learn to ignore the other stimulus, but yet it is possible. So at the initial point, what we find is just what what we had thought before is that our attentional resources do compete for the processing of both stimuli, but as time passes on, we really do try to ignore that other stimulus so that that way we're not necessarily focusing in on that particular stimulus in that instance. So rather than us trying to process both continuously, you just end up telling yourself, I can only do one processing of one stimulus and I'm only going to focus in on that message that's being given to me. So here we're going to try this out by looking at this idea of, uh, of the shadowing task and we're going to look at what's called dichotic listening. So essentially dichotic listening is the idea of the shadowing task that we're going to have multiple stimuli that are going to be coming in. In this specific instance, we're going to have um, one specific storyline that's coming in from the right side, one specific storyline that's coming in from the left side. So if you do have some headphones here, I would definitely recommend getting some headphones prior to uh, listening to this portion of the lecture. Because it's gonna, if you don't really have your headphones on, it, it may not necessarily make very much sense. But if you do have a pair of headphones, I would definitely recommend it. And then make sure that your headphones do work, because uh, I know that sometimes, you know, uh, one headphone or one side of the headphones may not necessarily work over the other. So if you can, go ahead and get yourself some headphones. If you want, you can go ahead and pause the lecture and then come back when you're ready. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start our dichotic uh, listening task in this specific instance. So here, we won't listen to the entire dichotic listening, uh, but here we're, we're only gonna do it for about a minute or so. All right, so put on your headphones and now we're ready. Except as otherwise provided in this title, uh, as used in this title, the following terms and their variant forms and the following. An anonymous a, work is a work on the copies or phone records of which no natural is, person is identified as author. It, an architectural work is the design of a building as embodied in any tangible medium of expression, including a building, architectural plans, or drawings. For the work includes the overall form as well as the arrangement and composition of spaces and elements of with, design, but does not include as standard features. Audiovisual works are works that consist of a series of related images, which are intrinsically intended to be shown by... All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the, the, 
the, the task right there just for a second because I want you to think about what it is that's happening here. So here I didn't really tell you, focusing on the message on the right, focus on the message on the left. So here when we initially start, you really do start trying to process both messages that are being transmitted on the right and also on the left side of uh, the headphones. Now, what you start doing as time passes on is that you start saying to yourself, well, I can't do this. I can't really focus in on both of the messages that are being given to me because they're competing for the same resource in this specific instance, the auditory resource in terms of attention. So rather, what do we do? We're gonna go ahead and ignore one of them and we're gonna then process information on the other side. So here you probably told yourself, I'm gonna ignore what's on the right side of uh, my auditory information. I'm only gonna process information that's coming in from the left side or you said you were gonna ignore the left and you're gonna process what's on the right, depending on whatever it is that you want. But now here I'm gonna go ahead and restart it and we're gonna go ahead and try this again with continuing with the information that's already given to us, but now only focusing on one side of the message. So you decide, you're gonna to listen to the right side or to the left side, but only listen to one. All right, so here we go. Ash, or devices, one, projectors, viewers, or electronic have equipment, together with the sounds, if any, Regardless of the nature of the materials, such as films or tapes, in which the works are embodied. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. So now, for instance, that you've decided whichever one to, to listen to. So in my case, I decided that I was only going to listen to the one on the right side. I started hearing information about projectors, uh, about some uh, aspects associated with it. It sounds like almost like if it's copyright information in this particular instance, that there's protection associated with it, that, with those kinds of devices. So here I start focusing information or start focusing my attention on that specific piece of information that's being given to me rather than... Um, on anything else that's being given to me on the other side of the same stimulus. So in this particular instance, what's coming on the left side of my ear, I'm not paying attention to that information. So here, this demonstrates for us that we can actually filter out information and not pay attention to it. But now at the same time, as you've noticed, we're not saying that it completely ceases to exist. So it's not like if that stimulus, then just you cannot process anything about it. You don't even notice that there's a sound there. You still notice that there's a sound there. Some information may still come in, very, very little. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so here we're gonna try a selective attention task. Uh, the selective attention task, it's a, it's a very interesting task. If you're watching this alone, uh, I would recommend watching this alone and really following the directions that are being given to you here in terms of the video. So again, here, put on your headphones and then watch the video in its entirety. All right, so uh, I'll, if you want, pause the video for a second while you get your headphones and then get ready to, to watch the video. All right, so if you're ready to watch the video, let's go ahead and click play. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about the... All right, so this is a great example about selective attention. Uh, I really enjoyed this particular version of the video uh, because I did notice that in last week's discussion board, uh, a couple of you had already looked at this video uh, beforehand, that some of you have mentioned that in Intro to Psychology uh, or in other classes that you had taken, you had kind of been exposed to something about this, and some of you even posted links uh, to a video associated with this one. And more than likely, it may have been the original video that it looks like if they're like in a basement uh, of... Uh, 
uh, some building and they're passing the ball and the only thing that changes in the entire scene is the, is the monkey. So here that the gorilla actually comes through the scene. Uh, and I'll be honest, you know, the very first time I ever saw this, uh, I was in a class about a hundred people and uh, only about 10 of us actually saw it. And I was one of the 10. And it's not that I'm like, whoa, I'm amazing. I can actually spot this information. It's really not that. It's just that some individuals really do spend a lot more time trying to identify if things are changing in their environment. And I'll tell you, for instance, for me, one of the things that I really like to do in, in, in my pastime is, and this is a very nerdy thing, I like to do those, um, you know, find the missing information between the pictures. So like the picture changes, you know, uh, that, you know, from one image to the other, and sometimes like a tree is missing or, you know, a car is missing or the license plate changes. I really, really like doing those kinds of activities. Like those are like my favorite things to do, especially when I'm traveling, I'll buy a book uh, on those and I just completely go crazy using them. So I've always, since I was a kid, loved doing those kinds of tasks. So for me, this one in particular doesn't work because I already kind of want to explore specific scenes and try to get as much detail as I can. But for some individuals who've never seen this, the very first time it's very difficult for them to identify that a gorilla has, has gone through the scene. And sometimes they won't even believe that the gorilla has gone through the scene. Even when you replay the message for them, sometimes for them, they're just like, no way, like that was totally impossible. We could never have done that. You know, no, 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 the video changed. But in reality, it's there. So many of you have probably seen the original one, but in terms of this one, I always like it because there's more things that are changing. So even if you aren't already expected that the gorilla was gonna be there, you probably didn't expect that other things were gonna change. Now, I've seen this video 10, 20 times, and to be honest, I keep forgetting about that person who leaves. I know that the gorilla's coming, I know that the curtain changes, and I forget about that person leaving. And every time that they give the explanation about that person leaving, it makes me mad that I'm like, I missed it, when I think I should have caught it. But here, one of the reasons that this particular illusion works really well is for those of you who had already seen the gorilla um, experiment, is that in this particular case, your attention is driven to the spot that you know is gonna be interesting. So then other things around your environment that don't seem that critical and important seem now to be able to change and you miss that information. So here the curtain changing and the player leaving may not really have seemed like an important thing for you, but really the gorilla was your focus of attention and that's where your eyes were gonna be driven to. Now, when we think about attention being selective, uh, attention being selective is, is a very important thing for us. I mean, in terms of, of being able to attain this, you know, how do we actually do this? And to be honest, attention becomes selective really with our eyes. So here, if we think about visual processing, you, we can actually nail down three specific eye movements that we really deal with you know, on a consistent basis. And the three eye movements that we have are what we call saccades, fixations, and also regressions. So one of the things that we try to do whenever it is that we're processing information is we use our eyes, you know, because a lot of our world is visual in its nature, to really explore the scene that we're in, explore the environment that we're currently walking through, and see what's out there. So what we do is we are exploring. How do we how do we actually achieve that? The first part of it is through what we call these saccades, our rapid eye movements. So here we're not talking about you being asleep or anything. Here you are completely conscious. You are awake. You are are walking through an environment and here in this specific instance what's happening is your eyes just shift back and forth back and forth back and forth as you're exploring the world uh, if you've never actually seen your eyes do this I would definitely recommend it uh, one of the things I would maybe recommend you do is while you're watching this video if you can put your phone and put the camera recorder um, you know facing in your direction don't look at the phone or, you know the recording all you're gonna do is you're going to read something so for instance you can be reading this slide right here and just put the phone to record and point to, towards your eyes and let it record for about 10 seconds and then after those 10 seconds replay the um, uh, the, replay the video and then take a look at what your eyes are doing and you'll be amazed at how much your eyes really do move whenever it is that we're exploring scenes especially in something like reading that our eyes are consistently moving now one of the incredible things that we find is that since we're exploring these scenes since we're scanning a scene or scanning you know whatever it is that we're reading our eyes are moving and they're helping us scan so these movements that we have which are completely natural are completely gonna be helping us trying to see as much information as we possibly can throughout our environment. Now, one of the things that we need to happen is that we need to focus our attention. 
How do we do that? We do that by creating what's called a fixation. Fixations are small, very, very small pauses in our eye movements that ultimately indicate where the person is paying attention to. So in other words, wherever your eyes stop for a very brief point of time means that you are paying attention to that specific word, to that object, uh, to a specific sound in that general direction and you move your eyes in that general direction, whatever the case may be. But those fixations ultimately indicate for us where attention is being processed. So you're spending more time processing information at that point than you are at a saccade. So in other words, saccades just help us quickly scan the scene. Fixations really help us focus in on that information and really process it a little bit more deeply. Now here we're not talking about seconds or even minutes of your eyes focusing in on one particular word or on a particular object that's out there in your environment. These are very, very brief um, seconds here that are occurring, uh, you know, milliseconds that, that this may actually occur at. Now, one of the incredible things that we find is that, that fixations are very important for us. Saccades and fixations are incredibly important. But we also find that regressions are critical for us to be able to function in our world, especially in something maybe like reading. So whenever you read, or even whenever it is that you're walking out in the street, or you're walking at the mall, or wherever it is that you are, you do a lot of regressions, and you probably don't even notice. If you've now looked over that video that you took a recording of your eyes, you'll notice that your eyes continue to go back. They'll go back in terms of whatever it is that you process. So you'll notice where your eyes go forward, but then your eyes also go back. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why do my eyes go back? Your eyes go back because they're reprocessing, reprocessing information. So when you read, you read quite a bit and your eyes scan information. They hold your information as well, your attention for just a very brief period of time in the way of a fixation. And then sometimes we may have to revert back. We regress, right? Creative day, the naming process for cognitive psychologists. We regress to reread or reprocess information. Out there in the real world, you're scanning the scene with your eyes. You may focus your attention on a particular object. You continue on, but then you may want to go back and reprocess that object. Why would we want to continue to do that? Because sometimes we need a little bit more of elaboration in terms of that object and really focus in on that object a little bit more and give it a good old re, you know, a good rescan if you want to think about it like that. So that, that way we can process that information a little bit more deeply. So that, that way we can see what it's all about. Now this occurs for us whenever it is that we're reading, whenever it is that we're watching anything, whenever it is that we're using our eyes. Very, very important. Now here, for instance, when we think about what our eyes really do look like whenever it is that we have um, a reading of a passage, uh, I actually have two videos here for you, or, or one video, and then I have the results of, these vi of this video. A number of years ago, a friend of mine who, who did research on eye movements uh, had a eye tracker. And an eye tracker is a, a very a cool device that we use that shoots a little laser into your eye and it essentially tracks where your eyes are focusing or where they're scanning or where they're regressing in terms of a page that you're looking at, in terms of you know a screen. It, it was this particular case because I was looking at a computer and I was reading this information there. Now, one of the things about you know, being able to use a technique like this is you really do want to be able to look at all three of these eye movements, you know, saccades, fixations, and regressions as well. So in our particular case here, uh, what uh, my fellow, uh, you know, psychologist did, we tracked my eyes reading this particular story. And if you've kind of looked over this story for just a couple of seconds here, if you want, you can pause and kind of look over the story. You'll notice that this story really doesn't make a lot of sense. So Buck did not read the newspapers or he would have known that trouble was brewing, not alone for himself, but for every tide water dog, strong of muscle and with warm long hair, for Punit Sound to San Diego, because men groping in the Arctic darkness had found a yellow metal. And because steamship and transportation companies were booming in the find, thousands of men were rushing into the Northland. So here, if you'll notice that none of this really makes sense. And that was a whole idea that none of this information would make sense and it would force you to, to regress. It would force you to move your eyes back and reread some of this information because you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't make any sense. And if it doesn't make any sense, what should you do? Reprocess or reread the information. So here I'm gonna play this video and you'll notice what my eyes are doing. How do we know what my eyes are doing? It's this green little dot right here, all right? So just as what anybody would do, we always focus right on the center of things first, and then we begin to do whatever the task would require us to do. So here are my eye movements.
All right, so what does my eye or what do my eye movements look like now whenever it is that we've actually gone through and read this information? And here are the results. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, these are crazy results. What is it that's going on here with all these arrows and all these numbers? Essentially here what you'll notice that we have a bunch of arrows moving and then we have also numbers above them. The numbers above those arrows represent each eye movement that's occurring. So each cicada that's occurring in this particular instance. Now the darker that the line is, it essentially means the more time that I'm spending looking at some of that information. So you notice that some of these lines uh, are a little bit uh, weaker in terms of their line in, in terms of their thickness versus other ones. So you'll notice that for instance this arrow right here is very very thin versus these arrows that are right here because I'm not spending that much time doing this movement versus this movement here. So in other words I'm spending much more time reading that information. I have more fixations versus this. Now, whenever it is that we actually have uh, some of these arrow movements, you'll notice that some of the arrows are actually pointing also to the left. Those are gonna be my regressions in this particular case. So this is a very natural thing whenever it is that we read, that we have our saccades, we have our fixations, and we also have our regressions. So within those uh, 50 seconds that it took me to read this story passage, I did somewhere about 155 eye movements just to my right. Or, or 155 eye movements in total, sorry, no, I shouldn't say just to my right, uh, because here it does also include the ones that are regressions in this particular case. So it's very, very interesting results, and we can see that ultimately we can identify attentional aspects associated with reading just by looking at some of this information that's here. So it's quite incredible for us to be able to experience and be able to see how uh, your own reading ability uh, works. It would be awesome if, if we had eye trackers for everyone and you'd be able to do it. The best in this particular case is my uh, recommendation to track your eyes using your camera phone so that way you can kind of see your eye movements just a little bit. I think that that's a fun task to do. So when we think about attention uh, and we think about wanting to not attend to certain types of information and we want to ultimately try to eliminate information from our world, we can really try to attain that as best as we can. So just like what we saw with the dichotic listening task, that here you really focus in on information on one side of your ear and eliminate some of the information that's on the left side, but you'll notice that some of the information is still there. So you can still hear that information, but you may not necessarily be processing it deeply. So in other words, you may not necessarily know what was said, but you know that something was there. So whenever it is that we think about attention, we really do find that there are certain situations where our attentional ability seems to surprise us. And what I mean by this is that there are certain situations on where you don't think that you were paying attention to something, but yet you recognize something that was said or something that, that was out there in the world and it draws your attention to it. So it draws your eyes, it draws your ears, it draws whatever sensory system it is that you're using. One of the ways that we detected this uh, idea that ultimately we're still processing some information is ultimately what we call the cocktail party effect. And what the cocktail party effect indicates for us or what it, what it predicts is that you're able to catch information, specifically your name, in situations that are very, very complex in terms of an auditory stimulus. And essentially here, it's called the cocktail party effect because people used to go to cocktail parties, what we would now call parties. But here, people would go to cocktail parties and what they would do is they would find that while they were talking to an individual, if somebody else said that person's name, even though they were engaged in a conversation with another person and they couldn't hear the other person very well, they couldn't really identify what that conversation was about, if they heard their name, their attention was automatically drawn to that person. And we find ourselves doing that all the time, that if somebody says your name, Mary, you're very, very quick to turn and say, well, who's talking about me or I heard my name. Why is it that we turned? Why is it that we heard our name when we're not even in that conversation? You're engaged in a conversation with an individual, but yet somebody else said your name. Now, one of the things that we find is that, again, it goes back to this idea that we are quite selfish individuals, that we really do think of ourselves ahead of anybody else. So when you think about Mary and the name Mary, are you the only Mary that exists out in the universe? And if you're saying to yourself, yes, yes, I am, well, you know you're not. 
But here, in reality, your world does really revolve around you. So when anybody says the, the name Mary, you automatically turn and you say to yourself, hey, why are they talking about me? Who said my name? Because you assume that it's in reference to you. That's part of the unconscious processing that's occurring that you don't even recognize that your name is, that, that somebody's having a conversation over there and that your name was all of a sudden called and your attention was shifted over. So what we assume is that we have pre-attentive process occurring. So in other words, we're able to still process information even though we're not consciously aware of processing information. So here, the cocktail party effect was great evidence for that idea that even though you're engaged in a task such as a conversation with another person and you're having a conversation back and forth, if somebody still says your name or something relevant to you, you're much more likely to shift your attention to see why it is that they're talking and you'll even move your eyes in their direction to see who was using your name or who was talking about you. Or even your attention shifts in terms of, you know, you may still be looking at the person, but what you listen to now all of a sudden shifts to listening to that conversation over there. So here picking rather than the right side of the conversation in terms of the dichotic listening task to the left side of the conversation or whichever side it is that you want in that particular instance. So ultimately, you would assume that you wouldn't be processing that information because you're engaged in the task, but ultimately you're still going to hear your, that some of that information because we have pre-attentive processing occurring. So in other words, we have information that's occurring at an unconscious level. Now, we can also find that whenever it is that we're looking at this idea of attention and we're looking at, for instance, scanning of a scene, we can find that on the left-hand side, you'll notice that you, you were very, very quick at identifying what, um, what type of shape is different than all the other ones. And you'll notice that very, very quickly your eye shifted to scanning that scene and you very, very quickly identified that there was a circle right here for you in the, midst, in the midst of all these squares very, very quickly. But now if you shift over to the right image here, you'll notice that now it becomes a little bit more difficult to identify which one's the one that's different from all the rest. And the one that's different from all the rest is going to be the red circle. So there's only one red circle in all of this in all these shapes right here. We have lots of blue, we have lots of red, but red squares and only one red circle. So why is it that here on the left, the red circle is very easy to identify, but over here it's a little bit more complex? Well, you'll notice that here, there's only one object that's vastly different from all the other ones. Thus, it's gonna call your attention. Over here though, there's lots of objects that look similar to the one that's the target object in this instance. So here it's quite more difficult to be able to identify and it takes a little bit more effortful processing to be able to identify what that object is. Out there in the real world, same, come up, same kind of idea. Let's assume that you're out in the forest and there's a lot of trees out there. Here, if you're trying to find one little tree that's different from all the rest, if that tree is vastly different from all the rest of the trees, just as this circle was vastly different from all these squares, it's probably gonna be quite easy for you in terms of your field of vision. But now let's say that there's lots of trees, big trees, and also little trees, but there's one little tree in particular that you really want that's unique, it's gonna be much harder for you to identify that one little tree because there's lots of little trees also in that forest. So even though you're scanning and you're looking for a little tree, there's little trees that don't fit your criteria for what it is that you're looking for. So here it's gonna take a little bit more effortful processing to be able to identify what that, uh, what that little tree that's of interest to you where it's at in that particular case. So we continuously find that attention seems to be, again, limited. Attention seems to be selective. And if you've probably noticed, you've gone through some of these things as we're going through the lecture. Attention has been limited because you've probably had a pause a couple of times as we've gone through the lecture because the lecture has now uh, been going on for about 50 minutes now, so it's been quite a bit. Uh, attention is also selective, that you're paying attention to certain elements out there in the world because if you're in a crowded place right now trying to listen to this lecture, you probably really haven't paid too much attention to this information. But yet now we come to our third factor associated with attention. And what is that third, that third factor? That everyone has attentional processes. Everyone has attention, but yet we all have different degrees of attention. So we are individually different, but yet we all do have this ability to be able to pay attention. So what do we find? Attention is a universal cognitive system. So in other words, everyone has attentional processes. Now, one of the things that we do find though, is that we can be somewhat a little bit different in terms of our attentional abilities 
from person to person. Some people work a lot more in terms of paying attention to specific things out there in the world versus others. So for instance, for me, one of the first things that I found whenever it is that I began to be a professor at a university, and this was over 10 years ago that I started teaching university classes, and this was back when cell phones had, were really becoming more popular in university settings, so not everyone had a cell phone. It was really kind of hard for you to identify if a person was using a cell phone. And the reason that it was a little bit difficult to do that was because now all of a sudden you had these desks and the people and students would hold this object, you know, this phone, you know, underneath the desk. And sometimes they would be texting or they would be looking at their phones and you really couldn't catch that information. But as years have now gone through or gone past me, and I won't say how many years because it'll make me sound old, but as the years have gone past me, I've gotten better at detecting when individuals are using their cell phones. Because in the sea of faces of people that I'm looking at, at, talking about a specific topic, I can really now start distinguishing, hey, who is doing something that's different? And more than likely, they're doing this kind of task. So in other words, we can actually train ourselves by having more and more experiences that, fo that force us to have our attention to be able to then work on our attentional abilities and make it a stronger cognitive system in our particular case. We also see that we have a uh, cognitive architecture such as the, orient, uh, the orientating reflex. And with the orientating reflex, we see this a lot with newborns, that this is one of the primary reflexes that infants see, is that whenever it is that we touch the cheek of a newborn infant, normally what they'll do is they'll turn in the direction of wherever the touch occurred because that normally indicates feeding for them. So in this particular case, if you, t if you want the child to turn, especially a newborn infant, one of the ways you do that is you touch their cheek on the left or on the right hand side and they will move their face in that direction. So it normally is bringing their attention to a stimulus that's occurring there and more than likely it's going to be indicating for them that feeding is going to be occurring at, the, uh, at that time. So here, it's very important for us to be able to see that attention is really driven by things that are occurring to us out in our environment. So we direct our attention towards unexpected stimuli because in certain, in certain situations, we're gonna try to identify what that stimulus is. So we want our attention to shift. We want our eyes to look upon an object that's calling our attention. Or if a sound occurred in our world, we want to turn and see where that sound is coming from, or maybe just listen a little bit more closely, just so that, that way we can really try to process that information. Because if we're thinking again about what our basic purpose is, again, it's to survive. So here, if an object ex exists out there in our world, such as a loud bang exists in our, on the left side of our world, we shouldn't just stay frozen and look forward. We should turn and look in that direction just in case it's something that may potentially be hazardous hazardous to us and we need to act quickly because the only way I'm going to be able to have a reaction is going to be based on my ability to focus attention because it brings us back to our point that we talked about last week. The stimulus occurs out there in the world. I need to create electricity, but to create electricity, I have to focus attention on the stimulus. So in other words, my sensory system has to be able to receive the physical stimulus. That's what it needs to do. It needs to receive the physical properties of that stimulus. If it does not, we're never going to process that information. So if there's a sound that exists on the left-hand side of your, of your world, you can hear it, but you need much more than just hearing it. You need to be able to look at it so you can be able to identify it, right? Because it may be an object that may be existing out, your, out, out in your world rather than just a sound. So you need to be able to look in that direction. If you don't, you're never going to be able to recognize what that object is unless you just recognize it solely on based on sound. And we also have habituation occurring to us, and this is also a part of the basic elements associated with our cognitive architecture. And habituation essentially occurs whenever a stimulus is no longer novel to us, and it doesn't capture our attention for any longer. So ultimately, we become bored. As we become bored, we have less performance and less ability to really focus our attention on that particular object. So just like with, and I don't mean to sound weird on this particular case, but just like with drugs, so people get uh, tolerance levels associated with drugs. Same thing happens here with us processing information. We get bored and we need something stronger in terms of the physical stimulus to bring our attention back to that scenario. So in terms of a lecture, for instance, you need to do something quick. You need to do something um, that's gonna create a bang situation in terms uh, of the lecture so that, that way it brings people's attention back to whatever it is that you're talking about rather than losing them. That's why attention is lost during lectures 
because the students become habitualized in this specific instance and they need a bigger dose of that drug in this specific case because in reality, lectures are like drugs, right? We get hooked on them. They're awesome. I know that sounds super nerdy. ...to us whenever it is that we encounter new information. Well, researchers have been able to identify that whenever it is that we encounter novel stimuli, ultimately we find that there is an increase in two circuits of the brain. These two circuits is what we've called the where and the what circuits. And ultimately what the where and the what circuits are able to do for us is they're able to tell us location information as to the where part. So in other words, where in my world do, is this stimulus coming from? So in other words, the sound occurs out there in the world. It draws my attention, so it makes me turn my head to be able to identify where that object is coming from. So is it coming from my left? Is it coming from my right? From the top, from the bottom? What's happening with that particular object? Where is it coming from? The where processing part is going to be coming from the primary visual cortex, which we're going to find in the occipital lobe, which is going to be in the back portion of your brain. Because we find that on the occipital lobe, we process visual information a lot more deeply than in other areas of our brain. So here, whenever it is that we're going to hear a sound that's out there in our world, we're going to shift our attention to that object and we're going to end up looking at that object so that, that way we can at least identify where the object is coming from. Because this is going to be very, very important for us. Because if you notice, we say where before what. Why is it that we care about where before what? Because where, if it's hazardous, it's going to be much more important for me to identify that there's an object out there in the world and know where that object is that's potentially hazardous to me rather than saying, well, first, let me identify what it is and then I'll figure out what to do. No, because you're going to see it first and then you're going to potentially react. So here in the case, for instance, that, that I showed you a couple uh, weeks ago, that I tossed the object uh, to my wife for her to be able to catch, in that particular instance, I tossed the object. For her, it's much more important the where part rather than the what part. Now, once it is that she caught the object, now we can start working on the where part, or sorry, on the what part. Where do we work on the what part? We work on it on what we call the primary auditory cortex. We find that we have a lot of recognition aspects that go associated with, with that area of the brain and we're able to take out information such as category uh, naming or category labels. Why is it that we have processing in the auditory cortex occur for the recognition and the naming of objects? Because we find that that is where language processing occurs uh, in terms of our uh, auditory cortex that you'll notice that is right in our temporal lobe area. So it's right above where our ears. So we find that there's language processing uh, abilities there, such as Wernicke's area and also Broca's area for comprehension and production that we're going to talk a little bit later on in the semester about when we get to language. But ultimately, we find that there's processing of that information there. So the where information, processing the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. The what information, primary auditory cortex for the temporal lobe because that's where we normally have language, or that is where we have language. I won't say normally, because if we say normally, then I would assume that there are certain instances where somebody's language wouldn't be there, but that is where we uh, identify that language is processed in terms of comprehension and also in terms of production. So we also find that with attention, we find a very interesting phenomenon that's called the attentional spotlight. We've already alluded to this idea of the attentional spotlight at the beginning of the lecture, but here I'll reinforce this idea. And so essentially the attentional spotlight refers to this ability to focus in our attention on one particular stimulus out in our world. We did this with the gorilla, uh, with the gorilla example in that you all were able to focus in on the gorilla. For those of you who had already seen the gorilla experiment, you focus in on the gorilla and not on the other objects that were existing in our world. So ultimately here our attention is really moving like a spotlight. We move and we focus in on one particular piece of the entire scene and we ignore other information. Now, does it mean that you can't see anything around there? That's not what we're saying, but we're saying it's just a little bit dimmer. So just as with the spotlight, right on whatever it is that you want them to focus in on, that's the brightest, but you can still see a little bit of what's outside of the spotlight, but it's not necessarily that clear. Same thing is happening here with attention. Now, what we also find is that it takes time to shift attention from one thing to another. So there is going to be some processing discrepancies that are going to be occurring. So as you shift your eyes from point A to point B, there's going to be some lag in terms of your ability to, f to have information being processed in those instances because we do have attentional shift delays. Now here, we also find that attention is limited in terms of its range. 
And we have lots of empirical evidence that really suggests this idea that we have this attentional spotlight and that we have a range of what it is that we're able to process. That I can't process everything that's out there in my world. I can't process smell, touch, taste, uh, visual, auditory, all at the exact same time. I can try as best as I possibly can, but if I really want to focus in on one particular thing such as a smell, I need to stop doing the other tasks, maybe even close my eyes, put on my headphones, drown out some of that noise and just focus in on the idea of the, what the smell is or even what the taste is, blocking out of the thing. So really focusing that spotlight on that particular idea. Now we even see that we have what the attentional processing component associated with attention in that we have this idea of the filter. Now ultimately with any filter, we see that we have kind of this funnel shaped idea. And what we find is that there's lots of information out there in our world. So think of all these little beads as being all the information associated with visual, auditory, um, smell, taste, touch. All our sensory systems have lots of input that's coming in. And you need to process this information. And again, just as we would want to do in any situation, I want to process everything. But I can't process everything. So rather, what's going to end up happening? As information starts coming into my sensory systems, only certain pieces of the puzzle are going to come in. Now here, even though we see here in this particular example that everything gets in, this isn't really what happens. So in other words, what may happen? We may only get this piece of the puzzle here, so that information that's being given to us through our filter. And then what happens to all the rest? It decays away because I now shift my attention to something else. So if this was just visual information that was processing at this particular instance, I'm processing visual information for one particular object, but now I move my eyes to the next thing, well now I have to restart it. So I have to now go back to the beginning and redo it again. And then as I focus in my attention and I really look at the object, I process more of that information. But then now I move to the next thing and again, and again, and again, and again. So again, we continue to see this idea that we do have kind of the spotlight idea. We have this filter idea as well that really does describe for us what attention is really looking like. So here that we see it's limited, we see that it's selective, and we also see that everyone has it, but again, we go back to this idea of it being limited and also selective. So when we try to attenuate to physical features associated with the stimulus, what are we really trying to focus in on? Typically what we find is that whenever it is that we're going to focus in on a stimulus, we focus in on key pieces of information associated with the stimulus. The overall larger picture if you want to think about it. So just as we saw in our previous lecture with, rec with visual recognition, that we're able to see the larger overall picture rather than the small little dots, same thing is happening here. That it's more important for us to be able to look at the whole rather than the individual fragments because that's going to be much more important for us. So in terms of attentional processing, yes, I can definitely look at all the physical features and all the little details associated with that stimulus, but to be honest, I may care more about specific information that's being given there. So what we find is that normally what do people attenuate to? We attenuate to things that are loud, things that have very high or low pitches, not things that are in the moderate pitch range, things that are very bright, and things that are very colorful. Now if you look here on the, the images that I've provided for you here, you'll notice that we have this weird pixelated image down here. If you're thinking to yourself, well that image didn't work, that sucks for you. Actually, this is exactly what it's supposed to look like. Our bottom image is actually what's called the saliency map. Our top image is what the participants actually saw. And what we see at the bottom is a map that's given to us by our uh, eye tracker that tells us where people are focusing their attention much more on than on other parts. The things that are actually wider and brighter here on our saliency map, on the one that's on the bottom, are actually where people are focusing their attention on. Things that are dark are things that people are ignoring. Or things that are very light in their color that are in the grayish scale. They're things that people looked at but really didn't spend too much time processing. So you'll notice here that this saliency map looks a lot like this image that's here. So you'll see here that we have the corresponding clouds. You'll also see that we have the border that's being given to us here by the image itself. The border that's being given to us between the waves and the sand. So you'll notice the white color of the, of the wave and also the sand, the brown color of the sand. And you'll also notice that there's these larger objects that people are focusing in on, such as that island and also, again, the clouds. So here, why are people focusing in on that? Because there are things that contrast drastically in my picture. 
things that contrast and pop out to me are things that I'm going to want to look at and process because that seems to be what's important for us in our world. All the other little things such as the blue sky, all right, yeah, I'll kind of give it a quick old scan. The water that's out there, I'll give it a good old quick old scan, but I'm really going to focus in on, on that element that's being created for me, that island that's being given to me. Those clouds are going to be very important. And you'll notice that the larger, brighter cloud on the left is processed and focused in on much more than the clouds that are on the right. So it's much, much brighter because it's larger and it's brighter also in terms of the colors that are being given to us. That's why one of the things that we find with children is especially with infants, if you want to capture children's attention, especially an infant, things have to be loud for them. Things have to be high pitch. We find that very frequently that they prefer high pitch sounds to low to low pitch sounds. So if you have a high pitch voice, such as whenever it is that you do what we call child directed speech, such as, oh, look at the cute little baby, you're so adorable. That brings the child's attention to the stimulus to you rather than saying, oh, look at that beautiful child, it's so adorable. They're much more likely to get scared of that versus a high pitch sound. Also in terms of brightness and in terms of color, we also see that with children's toys, if you've ever wondered why kids' toys are so crazy in terms of their colors, it's because it brings their attention to it. This is why also in terms of supermarkets, it's a very bad idea to take your children into the cereal aisle because things that are designed for children are always brighter colors. Look at Lucky Charms, look at Cheerios, look at Frosted Flakes, uh, look at Captain Crunch or any of those brands. They are very, very, very colorful and it brings children's attention to it. Uh, my three-year-old daughter, I've taken her to the grocery store a million times, and whenever it is that I, we go down the cereal aisle, aisle that I have to go down to get my cereal, I automatically regret it. But now, for instance, I look at my cereal and I go, my cereal looks boring. Why isn't it like cool for me? Like I want colors. I want like all these things to pop out at me. I want like a character to go with my cereal, and it doesn't. So when I look at that, I, I, I buy uh, grape nuts. So when I when when I buy that cereal, it looks boring and plain but it's delicious for me but for my daughter for instance she sees it and she's like no so for her she always picks lucky charms she always picks like the frozen one or whatever it is that she wants because they have all these colors that pop out at them and then you buy the cereal and then you bring it home and they're like oh no i don't want that because for them they lose the interest once it's out of the box the box is what brings their attention so here we see all those bright colors that those are the things that are attracting them now, when we look at trying to attenuate to information, we do find that there are two different types of filters that occur for us. Ultimately, the two filters that we have are what we call the early selection filter and also the late selection filter. What does the early selection filter look for us? It looks for the overall larger important information. The late selection filter is ultimately going to be information that's going to be in terms of content, such as our own name that we want to attenuate to. So with early selection filters, we're really going to be looking at the physical characteristics that we want to pay attention to. So again, going back here to our saliency map, those bright, loud, high-pitched, uh, very colorful elements in my world. But the late selection filter is going to be things that are going to be a lot more deeper processing that are much more meaningful to us in terms of something like our name that we're really going to be paying attention to. So we still have both filters. So don't think that just because it's a late selection filter that we're not going to attenuate to that information. We still will, but there's going to be things that are going to take priority, such as with our early selection filter, because those seem to be the much more important factors rather than something like our name. So here in our world, if you're looking out here at a beach situation, it's going to be much more likely that you're going to pay attention primarily to the clouds, to the borderline that's, the, that's right here between the water and the sand, and also that island, and all of those different elements that we see here in our saliency map versus something like your name being called on the beach. So here it's going to be much more important for you to process that information than other information. You still may be able to identify it and say, hey, yeah, it was there, uh, and hey, you know, I may have turned you know, a little bit late to be able to see it, or turned a little bit uh, late to try to see where that information was coming from in terms of my name, but yet you're still able to do it, but just at a lower, uh, a lower degree if you want to think of it like that. So when we look at this idea of attention and we look at trying to attenuate to relevant information, we really do have a specific theory that does look at this idea, and we call it the late selection theory. So ultimately the late selection theory predicts the following. 
even the supposedly unattended message actually enters our sensory storage. So again, going back to this idea here of late selection filter, that even though other people are having conversations somewhere else out there in, you know, I won't say out there in the world that they're like in another country, but they're, you know, 20, 30 feet away from you. If it's loud enough that you can hear some information, we're still going to have some of that information coming in. So even though it may not be as important as other information that's right there at the early selection filter, we're still going to have some information that's going to be coming in for you at the late selection filter. So ultimately, we're still going to be filtering some of that information, but it's going to be less information that's coming in. So for instance, if another individual is having a conversation 20 or 30 feet away from you, and you're having a conversation with a person one foot away from you, a lot more information is going to be coming in from the individual with, that who's one foot away and you're having a conversation with than information that's coming in from somebody who's 20 or 30 feet away from you. Now, we also look at this uh, idea of attention uh, trying to look at what we call automatic versus control processes. Uh, this is an idea that we've kind of already touched upon this semester, but we're going to go ahead and revisit it here. So when we've talked before about this idea of, of automatic versus control processing, uh, think of the following situation. There are things that you do in your world that when you first started to do them, they were very difficult for you to do. And the reason that they were difficult for you to do was because you really needed to pay a lot of attention to those tasks so that, that way you would be able to do them efficiently. But now as time has gone by, you've gotten much better at doing that task and you really no longer have to think about how to do that task. You just automatically do it. So for instance, driving a car. We've used this example before. So in terms of driving our vehicles, the very first times that we ever drove a vehicle, your heart was pounding, you were probably sweating, you probably didn't want people to talk in the car, you turned down the radio, you, you fixed your mirrors, you didn't want anybody to drink anything, you didn't drink anything, you didn't eat anything in the car, you turned off your cell phone, who knows? All of these different things. You had your hands on 10 and 2 even. But now, as the years have gone by, you've gotten much better at being able to multitask while you drive. So now you just get in your car, you turn it on, you hit reverse, and you go. You don't even think anymore about how hard you have to press the accelerator or how hard you have to press the brakes or that you are being able to eat while doing multiple tasks. So in this specific instance, you're driving this vehicle and now you've given yourself additional things to do because now that task of driving has begun to be easier. And it's not necessarily that it's an easy task, it's just you perceive it to be easier because now it's an automatic process. So here, I don't have to really give it too much conscious control or conscious attention to be able to do that task efficiently versus a controlled process. In a controlled process, I really have to think about that task. An example that I have in my world that I thought about this many, many years ago when I was in college and I was uh, a work study, uh, I used to work at financial aid office. And one of the things that we found at financial aid was that back in the day, we had to send everyone a printed out letter indicating for them how much financial aid they were going to be receiving. So we would print out the letter, we would have to fold them, stuff them, into the envelope, seal the envelope, and sort them so that, that way they could be sent out for uh, processing at, at the, the postal office. So it was a very, very tedious and boring task, to be honest with you. But I really learned the idea of automatic versus control processing when I started doing that. Because when you think about, for instance, folding a letter, you think to yourself, well, dude, it's not hard to fold a letter. Well, actually, it's kind of difficult to fold a letter appropriately to make it fit in the envelope appropriately as well because you don't want somebody to receive a letter that's all weird and crumpled up or all sideways because it looks bad. So here, to get a good letter to be folded, it has to take time. You have to think about, okay, I'm gonna fold this half and I'm gonna fold this other half and I'm gonna do this and do that and now I'm ready to go. And then to stuff it in the envelope and then to seal it appropriately and then to close it and then to be able to stuff it into the box so that, that way it can get sent out for processing. Here, it was a task that sometimes when I started, when I actually began doing that particular job, it took me, you know, a good solid, you know, 20, 30 seconds to be able to do one envelope. That's a lot of time if you really think about it because I was paying too much attention to the task. I really was trying to focus in on that task and do well. But as the days, as the weeks, as the months went by, I got a lot better at it. I could fold 
and this is no joke, I would grab 20 papers all at the same time and I would fold them all at the same time and I would stick a book on top of them and squash them really, really, really flat and then just separate them all out really, really quickly. So I had 20 of them that were already folded in a matter of 10 or 20 seconds. And then all I would do is I already had all the envelopes open and ready to get stuck. And all I would do is I would just grab the, the, the folded papers really quickly and just stuff them already into the envelopes as fast as I could. And one of the things that I would do is as I would stuff the envelope, I would normally then try with my thumb, I had the little, uh, th we had these little sponges that were wet. So I would stuff it into the envelope and I would pass my thumb right over uh, the adhesive and I was already getting the, the adhesive wet. So that, that way I could seal it. I didn't have to seal the whole thing I found. All I had to do was just kind of, in this particular instance, unfortunately, half-ass the sealing of the envelope. So that, that way at least it closed. It didn't have to go completely sealed, to be honest with you. So then here, I would just get the, the seal wet. Uh, and then I would just close it really, really quickly on the way back. I would be able to fold all 20 of them within, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. I was able to do 20 envelopes. So here, all of a sudden, it became a lot quicker. I didn't even have to think about it. I could listen to music. I could be looking at something on the computer while doing this task. And it was so easy for me to do after days, weeks, and months of doing this. Because then I would train people. And I would show them how to do it. And then they would get mad at me. And they would tell me, no, it's just too difficult. It's like, you got to try it. And then you'll go. Just as with any other task. So for me, at first, it was control, just as anything else would be in our world. Then it becomes automatic. Now, we see examples of this in the psychological literature, specifically what we call the Stroop task, which is a task that I've given you all to do for this week in terms of participation number three. So there's an online version of the Stroop task that will time how long it actually takes you to do its particular task. But ultimately, what does the Stroop task really want you to do? It wants you to go against the grain. So one of the things that we've been doing for you pretty much since you were about th you know three years of age, we've been trying to teach you how to read. And we've continuously taught you how to read. So look at the word, read the word, ignore the color of the word. We've pretty much never really told you it really matters what the color of the word is. So it's printed in blue. Really look at that. We've pretty much never told you that. So even when you print papers for yourself, sometimes you even print them in red or in hot pink or in purple or in any other color. It doesn't really matter. Because for you, you're not even going to focus in on the color that it's printed in, but rather you're going to focus in on the word itself because that's what we've been telling you to do for years. So here, that's the automatic process that we give you words, you automatically want to read the word. But what happens in the case where the word that's printed is a word that is a color? So here, for instance, we have this word that is printed. That is the word red, but it's printed in green. So it's a green color that contradicts the word red in this particular case. So here, one of the things that we find is that we ask people to go against the grain and we say, don't read the word, say the color that it's printed in. So here, the correct answer to this particular item is that you would say it's green. This one is yellow. This one is white. This one is pink. This one is orange and so on and so forth. Now you're finding here, it's a little bit hard for me to actually do this task because they're incongruent. So in other words, what's my brain trying to do? My brain's trying to tell me, dude, why are you totally trying to say the color of the word? Who cares? No one's ever cared about that. You've never cared for all your years in existence. And as if you guys have noticed, I still haven't told you my age. So all these years in existence, we've never cared about what, word, what color it's been printed in. And now all of a sudden you want me to focus in on that? Well, man, it's going to take me some time. So again, going back to this idea that attention is going to shift, so here the focus of my attention is going to shift from reading the word to saying the color that it's printed in is actually going to take some delay. So here the delay that you hear in my voice, me now saying green, blue, uh, red, blue, uh, red in this particular case, all those little delays are ultimately me forcing my attention to not read the word. This is completely normal because we're going against the grain. It's like driving a car that you've never driven before. So for instance, you have an automatic car that you've been driving for 20 or 30 years, but now all of a sudden you're going to drive a car that's manual. Well, here it's going to take some adjusting, but once you get the hang of it, then you're going to be able to keep going and it's going to become an automatic process. So here we're doing the same thing. We're demonstrating that, hey, we have this control task that we want you to focus in on, but yet the automatic process is taking over. So every single time we try saying the color that it's printed in, 
your brain is trying to say, read the word, because that's what you're supposed to be doing in this particular case. Now, there are very, very dangerous uh, attributes associated with automaticity. And automaticity is this idea of we rely on automatic processing to occur for us. One of the reasons that this can be very dangerous for us is that we may focus so much on this idea of, well, I've just done it a million times before, it'll be perfectly fine. That the less that you actually focus in on the task, the higher the probability of you performing that task incorrectly or having flaws in the task in itself. So rather, if you really focus your attention on the task, it's much better for you to be able to do well than if you were not trying to focus in on that task. I remember a number of years ago, a professor of mine, um, he said to us, well, I'm going to give you guys the exams that you've taken all semester long, and your final is going to be questions from your exams. And I'm going to pick question number one from exam one, two, three, four, and five from exam one. And I'm going to give them to you guys in that order on the exam. So pretty much all you had to do was look at each exam's questions that he was going to pick and memorize the order. So that, that way you could go in and take the exam in five minutes because you knew the answers already. You didn't have to read the questions. You just knew A, A, B, D, C, D, A, B, D, whatever the case may be. You just automatically went in and bubbled them in really quickly. But the trick was he was messing with us because on the exam, what did he decide to do? He used those questions, but he mixed them up. So the first question wasn't question number one from exam number one, but rather, it was question five from exam number three. So here, a lot of people had done just specifically that. All that they had done was just memorized A, B, D, 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 A, E, and so on and so forth. And then when it came time to the exam, they didn't focus in on the task. They didn't focus on reading the questions. So they circled the wrong answers, unfortunately, and people performed very poorly on the final. That's a very tricky thing that he did, but that was what he did because he was our psychology professor. And he was trying to teach us the importance of the difference between automaticity and controlled processes. So it's much better for you to perform well on a task if you really focus in on that task and make it a controlled process. So that, that way you're focusing in on that task and really trying your best to perform your, your best at that particular task. Now, we also find that with attention, we have many different phenomena that occur. And one of the most interesting ones, aside from just selective attention, is this idea of change blindness. Change blindness essentially refers to the idea of, can you detect changes that have occurred from one moment to the next moment? So in, in, as I was mentioning when we talked about selective attention, that one of the things that I like to do is I like to look at these kinds of activities. I like to try to find the differences between the same image. Now, one of the things here, for instance, if you look at these two images and you try to find the differences, the differences are extremely, extremely, extremely subtle. And this is no joke, guys. Uh, I've been looking at this for about the past 20 or 30 minutes, and I've only found one difference. And I really like doing these, but they've been really, really difficult for me to identify. And actually, I just found another one as I'm talking to you guys, so I'm quite excited about that because now all my time has not gone to waste in this particular instance. So I've at least found two. So if you're looking at these, try your best. Pause the video, try to find the differences between the two. All right, so if you've unpaused the video, now you want the answers. I've only found two so far. So the two that I found is the differences in terms of the size of this tree. So you notice that the size of the tree is a little bit different. And also you'll notice that there's some tree here and here there's no tree line right here. That's about the only differences that I've been able to find. I really haven't found any other ones. And they're kind of making me mad that I haven't found any other ones at this point. Uh, and potentially, for instance, maybe like the point here at this steeple right here, the little point, that might be a little subtle difference. But I don't know, I may be making them up now just to be honest, to, to try to find some differences here. But ultimately, it, we can see that the idea of change blindness is that when we're given very similar scenarios, it's quite difficult for us to find the differences because there are these slight differences and I wanna to try to detect them, but sometimes they're so subtle that we're unable to really detect some of those changes. Now, what happens in the case where we have larger differences? Can people detect those changes? And the answer is sometimes. So we've done lots of experiments. So the same individual who did the gorilla experiment, Dan Simon, has done other experiments associated with this idea of change blindness. He's the one who coined both of these terms, the idea of selective attention with the gorilla experiment and the idea of change blindness. 
And with the idea of change blindness, according to Dan Simon, what we find is that if we have these subtle differences between images or even in a, in a scenario, people are sometimes unable to detect that a change has occurred in those specific situations. So what do we find in these specific scenarios? We find that if you're directly focused in on an element, so for instance, if you look at this idea of the attentional spotlight, and you're looking at that specific element, and a change occurs within that specific spotlight that you're looking at, you're much more likely to detect a change rather than if you are looking at the periphery of that spotlight. So if other things are changing around that specific spotlight, it's gonna be very difficult for you to detect those changes just as we saw with the gorilla study. So in this specific instance with the idea of the gorilla study was that most of you were already looking at the gorilla since you knew that the gorilla was gonna be walking by. So in that particular instance, your focus is on the gorilla, but since the spotlight is only on the gorilla, you miss the information that was changing on the outside and the periphery of that spotlight. So here, Dan Simon has really been able to revolutionize, if you wanna think, this idea of what attention is all about. And he's still actively involved in research, and a lot of the research that he's done in the past has been fundamental for our understanding of what attention's limits are and how selective attention really can be. So in one of his most famous studies, Dan Simon essentially uh, did the following. He went out onto a university campus and wanted to see how much change can occur without a person noticing that a change has occurred. Now here you're gonna see this video, and you're gonna to say to yourself, okay, this is impossible. People would have totally noticed the change. I'm gonna show you a couple of different videos around the same idea. His most famous video and his very first one that he ever did in terms of his first study was what he called the door experiment. Essentially, the setup of the door experiment is the following. An individual walks up to a random person on campus and asks them for directions. So as the individual is talking with that individual about like, hey, how do I get to building X? This individual walks past right in between them with a door and one individual, the one who's asking for directions, switches out with a new individual, okay? So the next person who's talking to the person you know, who's giving the directions is a completely different person than the first one. And the idea was, can people detect the change? So here, we're gonna take a quick look at, the, at that video. The door study. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white-haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. Like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. Approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. This study was among the first to demonstrate that change blindness can occur outside of the laboratory. This video is from research by So when we, try to try, when we try to understand why this can occur to us, why does change blindness actually happen? So why is it that people are unable to detect that change? Because I mean, that's a huge drastic change, right? You would say to yourself, I would totally notice if, it, if I was talking to a different person than the one I was talking to. Really? Well, I mean, here we saw that many individuals did not even notice that. A large percentage of individuals never even noticed the change out in the real world, where people are so confident that they would be able to detect those changes. So why is it that they're not detecting those changes? And the answer is, they're not focusing their attention on who they're talking to. Their spotlight is focused in on somebody else. It's focused in on the paper, on the map, trying to find the directions. So here, they may have detected some object out there. They may have said, okay, yeah, I know that I'm talking to a person. It may be a man, a general idea as to who they were talking to. But now all of a sudden, the person has changed to another man, but it's a completely different person. The person may not have even noticed in any capacity. 
that they were talking to a new person since in that specific situation they weren't focusing in on the person that they were talking to but rather they were focusing on something like the map or on the person's shoes or on something else so we see that this happens quite frequently and this happens a lot to us in our world that we say I know that something was here. Like, I, I thought I was talking to that person. Okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I, I, I wasn't talking to that person. Maybe I was talking to this person. And here, you know, don't actually want to admit that when you're wrong either. So you don't ever really want to say, hey, something's happened here. So a lot of people, even the people that did, did detect the change, for them, they were kind of like, oh, I don't know. Like, it's kind of weird. Maybe, maybe not. So here I'm going to show you a couple of other videos associated with this idea of change blindness. But I just kind of want to reiterate this point that this happens to us a lot. This actually happens to us very, very frequently. Now, granted, there aren't these huge changes that we're looking at here, but yet there are still very moderate or slight changes that happen and we're unable to detect those changes, such as we saw in those two pictures uh, with uh, the Cathedral at uh, Notre Dame. So when we think about change blindness, there's another component that comes associated with this, and we call this inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is also another uh, phenomenon that uh, Dan Simon uh, was able to identify, identify for us in the psychological literature that ultimately what Dan Simon proposed was if we have very, very small changes that occur from one moment to the next moment, you won't even notice them. And the way that he ultimately uh, talked about this was, well, sometimes we're focusing our attention on different points in a scene or a different point in my world that I may not even notice that some minor, minor things may have changed. I, I'm not even going to pay attention. And to be honest, it doesn't really affect me in any capacity. So ultimately, there's some things that sometimes change, but in reality, I'm not paying too much attention to those anyway, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect me. In what scenario could this potentially happen in? Think about a movie situation. So you go to the movies and you're watching a movie. If you've ever noticed, for instance, Brad Pitt's hair in one scene, it's to the left, and then in, another, in a second later, it's to the right, and then all of a sudden, it's back to the left. And you think to yourself, oh, I think Brad Pitt's hair just moved. And you're like, no, I don't think that could have been it. But it potentially could have been. Or here that you notice something else that you're like, oh, well, you know, there was a person right here, another person is on the right-hand side, another person's back on the left-hand side as the movie's continuing on. Like, that's so weird. It was just a fractions of a second. Why did those things change when the perspective changed? And the idea is that that's inattentional blindness, that most of the time we don't even notice those changes, to be honest with you. But rather, sometimes we catch them if they're large enough. So if, for instance, Brad Pitt's mustache is, is, is there in one, in one moment, and then all of a sudden it's not there, and then all of a sudden it comes back, you're going to say to yourself, okay, that was a huge change because I was focusing my spotlight right on Brad Pitt's face. Why is it now that he's so different? And now all of a sudden it's back. There's something that's incongruent there. And to be honest, um, a movie, uh, movie studios actually hire people whose jobs in their entirety is to make sure that when they cut one frame to the next frame, that they are not going to have those types of errors. So when those big drastic errors happen, someone's in trouble. But when minor errors happen that nobody really catches, they're, they're perfectly fine because most of the time it doesn't really affect anything in terms of the movie. It doesn't draw your attention to something else and you say to yourself, oh man, this movie's terrible. Like they're having all these errors that are occurring in terms of the movie. So most of the time in movies, they will happen. And why do those errors happen? Well, because when you think of a movie, movie, a movie is still frames that are shown in rapid succession that create the illusion of a movie. Okay, so that's really what you're watching at a movie theater. You're watching pictures that are occurring very, very rapidly in quick succession that have audio associated with it that creates the illusion of movement. So none of that movement is actually happening. Rather, you just think it's happening. So in this particular instance, what happens? Well, they take a frame, but then when they were trying to record that scene, that scene happened, let's say, day one. Well, then sometimes they may come back day two and record that scene again. But they like one piece from, from day one and one piece from day two, and they splice them together. Once that splicing occurs, they better hope that what they were doing in frame one or in day one for that frame is going to be identical to what they were doing in frame two, and only one minor little thing may have differed. But in reality, the background should have been the same, the outfit should have been the same, the hair should have been the same, everything should have been identical. The only thing that may have changed was something that they liked from one to the, uh, to the next, 
but when they splice them together, you really shouldn't even notice that small difference. So here we're going to look at some examples of both of these, and I want to show you one more example of change blindness that uh, was a laboratory setting that Dan Simons did a, uh, research in, and then the second one is going to be the inattentional blindness example. So here's our first example. This is going to be our change blindness example. So what Dan Simon wanted to demonstrate to people was the following. So he actually received a little bit of critique with his door study in that people were saying, well, you know, there are some a lot of similarities between the individual who was first asking questions about the directions and then the second person who was behind the door. So, you know, what happens when we have very large changes? Will people be able to detect those? And according to Dan Simon, what he predicted was that, no, people still wouldn't detect those changes. People would still have change blindness occur. They still would never be able to notice those specific. So our results from our particular research uh, endeavor here given to us by Dan Simon is fundamental for our understanding of how change blindness really can occur, not only inside of the laboratory, but, out, but also outside in the real world. That even though we have these very large differences that exist between individuals, that we would assume that we would be able to identify these large differences between them and that we wouldn't be fooled by our uh, memory ability we still are unable to detect those a bit, those uh, those large differences and be able to identify that an individual has changed drastically in our situation. Now, the last example here that I'm going to show you, the last video that I want to present to you, is also again done by Dan Simon, who again looking at this idea of change blindness looks at the way that we can not really identify these minor differences that exist in movie settings. So imagine if we're unable to detect in most instances that an individual has changed drastically between uh, you know, a couple of seconds here from one individual to another, imagine minor differences that we may be able to uh, present to us in terms like of a movie setting. So here I'll present this specific scenario to you. Uh, so here we'll just watch this short video. This is a movie perception test. Watch this brief video of a conversation, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Hi, Sabina. Hi. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Andrea. So how did you get here? Oh, I took the subway from Middleton, and it took only about half an hour. Really? I drove from Gresham, and it took 45 minutes. Hmm, hooray for public transportation. So why did you call me here for this mysterious meeting? I'm planning a surprise party for Jerome, and I need your help to keep him away from the house. That's great. I'll do anything you need. Good. I hate surprise parties, but only when I'm the victim. Otherwise, they're great. Very good. Other than the strange dialogue about a surprise party, did you notice anything unusual? In our book, The Invisible Gorilla and Other Ways Our Intuitions Deceive Us, we discuss the illusion of memory. We think we perceive and remember more of our world than we actually do. The movie you just watched had nine intentional editing mistakes. Did you spot any of them? Watch it again. Notice that the woman on the right, Sabrina, is wearing a scarf. In a moment, we'll have a close-up and the scarf will be gone. Notice the scarf is gone and Andrea, the woman on the left, has her arm on the table. Now it's at her chin. Scarf is back. Notice that the plates are red. Now they're white and Andrea's arm is back on the table. Now they're red and Sabrina's arm is off of the table. Notice that the food is in front of Sabrina. Now it's in front of Andrea. The cups and the spoon have also switched places and Sabrina's arm is on the table when it wasn't before. Most people don't notice any of the changes, a phenomenon known as change blindness. So again, but this most is a people are. So again, this is a perfect example of exactly what happens to our attentional processes in terms of being able to perceive and also recognize that differences have existed in terms of our environment. We would assume that at least at minimum, we'd be able to perceive that a change has occurred. Maybe not necessarily recognize what the change was, but at least say, I think something is different in my world. And here we find that in most cases, people aren't even able to perceive that those differences exist. So to wrap up our discussion in our lecture for this week, what is it that we're really taking away from this lecture? Number one, 
we find that cognitive processes are not perfect. So in other words, our perception and our recognition ability is completely dependent on this aspect of attention. And that if we're not able to really focus our attention on a specific aspect associated with our event or with our specific scenario, it's gonna be very difficult for us to be able to identify that specific aspects may potentially change or even focus in on specific details associated with that stimulus. So we see here also that in terms of attention, attention again is limited, it is also selective, and it's also a cognitive ability or this archetype that all of us have within us. So in terms of us all having this uh, you know, architectural plan or this archetype associated with having attention as a cognitive skill, one of the main questions then that, that leaves us is how do we improve our attentional skills? How do we become better individuals at focusing our attention? And just as with anything else this semester, one of the things that you will learn, it all comes down with practice. That was the whole idea behind automatic and control processes, that the more effort that you actually put into a task and the more that you practice that task, the better that you will naturally become at that task. So things will become more automatic, but if you tend to focus and make that automatic task a controlled process again, leading you to have higher performance, leading you to have higher results or better results in specific situations. So all semester long, we'll revisit this idea of cognitive processes in terms of them not being perfect because that really is the punchline. And ultimately, how do we improve our ability to have better cognitive processes? Now that wraps up our discussion for this week in terms of uh, tension. Next week, we'll be covering chapter four. So please make sure to uh, prepare for that. If you have any questions, make sure to email me or please feel free to call me and I'll be happy to talk to you about any questions or concerns that you may have.